Okay, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so, yesterday we uh, we spent our time essentially setting up the underlying philosophy of effective field theory um, and discussing a bunch of different uh, high-level examples of different ways effective field theory appears in particle physics and cosmology and beyond, um, and discuss this idea of you know what it takes, how we construct an effective field theory, uh, what are the basic ingredients. So I want to just start by reminding you from the bottom up um, to um, define an EFT. We need our degrees of freedom. We need to know the symmetries, and we need to have some notion of power counting. And I had some great questions uh, after after the lecture yesterday, so I, I just want to clarify a little bit about um, what I mean with this phrase power counting, and then we'll see it appear again and again uh, in the lectures. But yesterday I used sort of an overly formalized technology for discussing just a relativistic scalar field theories in, in four dimensions. Um, the power counting I introduced, this uh, parameter lambda, was exactly equivalent to just counting the mass dimension um, as, as you're familiar with in the sort of standard treatment of QFT. Um, and the reason that I did it in this slightly different way with this dimensionless parameter was just to emphasize a bit of a more general way of thinking about power counting. Um, power counting is, is more general than just mass dimension, okay? So if you had just taken everything I discussed yesterday and replaced the phrase power counting with mass dimension, you would have had the same, come to the same conclusions, okay? So I don't, wanna, I don't want that to confuse anyone. There's another way of saying what I did yesterday, which is I had this scale capital lambda which was the, the fundamental UV scale in the problem. And so you can think about everything we did yesterday is working in units where capital lambda equals one. And this is really what we mean when we say there's some fundamental scale, some fundamental ruler. Um, we're always organizing ourselves in units set by that dimension. So if you like, when we talk about mass dimension, you can think about Similarly, uh, what we're doing is we're organizing ourselves in terms of some fundamental scale that's setting the size of a ruler. And so it's often convenient if we, um, if we to set the scale to one, and then we're always just talking about dimensionless quantities, and this idea of power counting is tracking the equivalence of mass dimension in this dimensionless version of the theory, okay? Um, so that's one thing I just wanted to um, emphasize in case that was confusing to you. Um, the but I was trying to so show you something that I hoped was familiar in maybe a slightly unfamiliar language. The second thing I want to say about power counting, and we'll definitely see this happening today in the main example we're going to work on, is that power counting is a UV assumption. Okay, So people often like to say effective field theory is a generic parameterization of low energy physics, that it's a model independent tool for understanding the properties of physics at low energies as long as you know the degrees of freedom and the symmetries. And that is a bit of an overstatement because inherent in effective field theory is always some kind of truncation in terms of the power counting parameter. So effective field theories are always by definition organized as an expansion, okay? They're an effective description. That's, that's why we use that word. And what that means is we're truncating in some parameter, okay? And the choice of how we introduce this parameter and what truncation we decide to use is tied to assumptions about the ultraviolet. So you can take the same theory and you can apply different types of power counting, okay? And um, and so the so it's it's semi-model independent or or it's as close to model independent as we can uh, as we can get, but always keep in mind that there's this UV assumption, okay? And again, in the example today, I'll, I'll point it out when we get there, but you'll see what we're gonna do today. We're gonna start with a UV model and we're gonna compute the effective field theory that results when we integrate out a heavy state, okay? 
And I'll highlight when we do that where the UV assumptions are and how they influence the power counting. Okay. Good. Um, any questions about that or anything else that's bothering you from last time before we get started on new stuff? Okay. Um, again, uh, please interrupt me, okay? I, the, the more interactivity, the better. Uh, we will have a discussion session today after um, at, at 4.30, so we can, of course, talk about some things that came up in the lecture or other things then. But um, especially now, we're going to get into calculations. Um, I'm trying to present these at a level where you can follow all the details. So if something's unclear, um, I expect it that it, I want it to be clear. So please uh, interrupt me, and, and I'll try to clarify. Okay. Good. Okay. So... One of the, as, as we learn more and more about effective field theory, it's extremely useful to think about how we can derive effective field theories making some UV assumptions. So from the top down, it's also useful to think about effective field theories just from the bottom up by using, using this set of rules. So we're going to investigate both of these perspectives today. Um, but I really want to stop, uh, I want to start with the, with the top down point of view. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a toy model, a really simple model um, in the UV, and then um, this will give us a platform so we can understand what it means to derive an EFT from a, from a UV description. Um, so here's our UV model. Okay, we have two scalar fields, phi, which is our light field, and eta, which is going to be our heavy field. Okay, so m phi is much, much less than m eta. And we're looking for an EFT that describes phi scattering at energies much, much less than m eta. So remember, again, Anytime we're, we're talking about an EFT, we need to specify what physical process we're actually interested in describing. So here we're going to do the thing that's most familiar, which is describe just scattering experiments in terms of the light field. Okay, And by studying the theory at low energies, we're going to be able to derive an effective description um, that's, that's sort of valid as an expansion order by order in, in E over M eta. Okay? So um, for simplicity, let's impose a Z2 symmetry. I should say these are real scalar fields. OK, so again, just, just keeping it as simple as possible. Um, so this symmetry acts non-trivially on the phi fields, um, but it acts trivially on the etas, okay? So we're going to allow ourselves to have odd terms in eta, but only even terms with, with phi, okay? And then we can just write the most general Lagrangian um, up to dimension, mass dimension four. So we have the kinetic term. For both phi and eta. And then a potential where the potential is lambda. This is really just a defined notation. OK, so Allowing myself all the renormalizable operators, all the operators up to dimension four, I have, um, and imposing this symmetry, so I only have even terms with phi, but I have odd terms with eta. Okay, so here's some odd terms. Okay, and the lambdas are dimensionless, the g's have mass dimension one. Okay. So one way to think about how we take this Lagrangian and extract physical, oh, please. Why, um, so, sorry, I guess? 
Ah, so um, so that's an input assumption. But uh, the reason that I'm that I'm taking that rule is because I'm going to want these odd terms in eta. You'll see when I draw some Feynman diagrams, it's just to give me the um, uh, the kinds of EFT operators I'm interested in. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Um, Good. So, um, so I'm always assuming that I'm expanding around uh, around the vacuum, and so uh, so then I absorb uh, any linear term. Yeah, exactly. Um, great. So, one technique we can use, which uh, is is a very nice way of understanding what the EFT is computing, is we can take the path integral. which is going to give us uh, time-ordered products of fields or correlation functions. And then from there, we can use the standard tools of the LSE reduction to extract S matrix elements, OK? Um, so we're not going to get into all the, all the technical details there, but, um, but let's just think about uh, what it is that we're going to compute when we compute the path integral in this particular scenario. Um, so, and here let's uh, restrict ourselves just to the phi correlation functions, okay? So we write the path integral as a functional of some external sources, and then when we take functional derivatives with respect to these external sources, that brings down factors of the phi uh, fields and gives us our correlation functions. So this full path integral, it's an integral over uh, field configurations for phi and integral over field configurations for eta, and then e to the i action of phi and eta, defined using this Lagrangian here, plus the source coupled to phi, okay? And this is shorthand. This is, of course, an integral over uh, d4x here, okay? And I'm making the assumption that I only include sources for phi, again, because I'm working at low energies, okay? So I'm really in interested in only uh, processes that have external phi particles, okay? Um, so this is the UV path integral, and now we can use this to derive the path integral for the EFT as follows, so we're define z effective, again, as a functional of j. This is the path integral taken over the field phi, e to the i s effective of phi plus integral j phi, okay? And so that's just notation, but now um, we can derive this s effective from the full theory by doing the integral over the eta fields. OK. So we'll often use this phrase when we talk about EFT of integrating out the heavy physics or the heavy field. That's because in the path integral language, that's literally what we do. OK. We define this S effective as the integral over the fields we're integrating out, okay? So, so we, sort, we mean that uh, terminology quite literally um, when we're doing EFT. Okay, so now, yes, please. Good, because we're only interested in the in the phi correlation functions. Yeah, so by assumption, right? Um, absolutely, we could have introduced that other current. We would just never have taken derivatives with respect to it. So um, no point in bringing it in. Um, good. So this object exists in principle for any theory, OK? And but the key point of effective field theory, the non-trivial thing that happens is when I go to compute this object, what I get is something local, okay? And for example, if the eta particle had been light, say massless even, then when I do this path integral over eta, 
what I would get is something inherently non-local, okay? Um, because essentially you would um, you'd get factors of propagators that you couldn't tailor expand, and so you would model those in the effective action using inverse derivatives. Inverse derivatives are a sign of non-locality, okay? And that's just the statement, the intuitive statement that you would have propagation would be important, that the propagation of this eta field would matter. On the other hand, if eta is heavy, then the claim, the non-trivial claim here, is that I can do this integral systematically, and I get something that's a local expansion, okay? So um, this is useful if S effective is local, okay? So that's the key idea. And just like I was saying yesterday, the idea of decoupling, of being able to integrate out at heavy physics and locality are intimately related to each other. And this is really where that statement is, is being made, okay? So we can see by just doing this order by order that what we're gonna find is a local expansion, okay? But especially when we get to loops, maybe later today or definitely next time, you'll start to get the impression that this is, highly, uh, this is a highly non-trivial fact about the EFT. Okay. So, um, let me just uh, be really clear. What do I mean by local? I mean that uh, L effective is a polynomial in terms of fields and derivatives. and that they're all evaluated um, at the space-time point x. Okay, so for example, no inverse powers of derivatives, no square roots of fields, things like that, right? It has to be analytic. It has to be uh, something that looks like um, a Taylor expansion. And in fact, when we uh, talk about EFT, again, because we're always imagining that we're working to some finite order in the power counting, this is going to be some truncated expansion. So it's always going to be a finite number of terms. Okay. So um, the procedure for deriving S effective is to integrate out the heavy field. So let's do that. Um, and first, I'm gonna just do it through a brute force calculation because th that gives you some intuition for the fancier technique we'll use in a moment where we'll literally integrate it out. Okay, and in fact, we're gonna use this, this more brute force approach uh, when we get to loops as well, okay? So um, let's just compute a few terms. Um, and we'll do this using Feynman diagrams, okay? So, IS effective of phi is gonna be something like the action just with phi by itself, plus diagrams like this, Okay, so this is pretty schematic. We'll make this more precise in a moment. Um, here I'm using, uh, write it up here maybe. I'm using notation where phi is dashed and eta is, is solid, okay? So that's how I'm gonna distinguish them. And, um, and again, this is, uh, this is to answer the question from earlier. This is why I wanted linear couplings that involved eta is just because then I get these simple contributions from two to two diagrams to the four point in terms of phi and the six point using this cubic coupling and, the, and these linear couplings, okay? Um, so this is, that was just an assumption taken to make my life as easy as possible. That's gonna be a theme. We're gonna do a number of these calculations in these scalar toy models where I'm gonna do, I'm only gonna write the interactions I want to, um, to make a point uh, to get the simplest possible example, okay? Um, so let's be a little bit more concrete. Let's focus on the four-point interaction, okay? So 
I have some generic interaction with four legs, and I can do this as an expansion. Um, so if I have one, two, three, four, then I also get, so I have my four point vertex there in the potential, right? This is set by that lambda, but I also have these type of diagrams. So I have ST and U channel where this is the S channel diagram, right? Just using momentum conservation at the vertices. And then, let's see, I'm going to leave that for now. So, okay, we just use standard Feynman rules from scalar field theory, and we can compute. Um, this just gives us minus i lambda minus i g squared, 1 over s minus m eta squared plus 1 over t minus m eta squared, 1 over u minus m eta squared. Okay. So this is the full theory calculation. Now I can take the limit where the EFT is valid, so we have e much, much less than m eta, okay? And the game here is just to do the Taylor expansion of the propagator, so 1 over p squared minus m eta squared um, is minus 1 over m eta squared minus p squared over m eta to the fourth, and so on. Okay. Um, so I can apply this expansion to this amplitude, so minus i times my four point vertex in the effective theory is lambda plus g squared over m eta squared plus g squared over m eta to the fourth times s plus t plus u. And of course, plus higher order terms. Okay. So now I see that I get this amplitude when I do this expansion and what I want is an effective Lagrangian that gives me this answer just from the Feynman rules of that Lagrangian. And so what does that look like? Simply, again, writing it as a polynomial in fields and derivatives, all in terms of phi now because I've integrated out eta. I see that I have L effective for the four point is minus one over four factorial lambda minus three G squared over M eta squared um, phi to the fourth and then minus G squared over eight M eta to the fourth phi squared box phi squared. And then of course, always as an expansion, okay? So this is not very systematic, right? This is just following my nose, taking a Taylor expansion, and writing a Lagrangian that exactly matches this, right? And you know, you can see, okay, maybe you'd have to think for a minute about this eight, but you know, don't worry about that too much. The structure of the couplings, right, is, um, is clear from, this expansion, and I have a sign, um, sorry. Okay. There's a sign, one of these signs is wrong. Um, I think this, these have the same sign, but then I think the, um, these should have opposite sign, I think. Right? Anyway, signs and twos are, you know, 
unlikely to be correct. Uh, okay. Um, good. So, again, at tree level, you're, uh, you're only supposed to be so impressed, right? Because what did I do? I took this thing that's non-local, I tailor expanded it, it looks like polynomials of derivatives, right? So, um, the, but conceptually, um, this is very powerful and something that, that holds order by order in perturbation theory, okay? So we can just think about diagrammatically what we've done is we took those diagrams up there um, and we have essentially zoomed out so that we can't resolve the fact that there's a propagating eta particle. And so what we're doing is um, we've replaced these propagating eta fields by just an effective interaction, okay? So we've shrunk the, um, if you like, you know, with some number of phi's coming out, down to a local interaction, okay? And, well, that's not a loop. That's supposed to be dot, dot, dot. Okay? And the reason you can think about intuitively the reason for this is that we know that in position space, um, propagation of a massive particle goes like, e to the minus rm, where r is the distance between the two points of propagation. And so as we take m to infinity, right, or as we go to long distances, we take r large, either way, we can take either of those limits, we expect to see an effective field theory, we are literally shrinking lines to points by taking that limit, okay? Because we're taking the, um, the correlation length, right, the distance of propagation is becoming vanishingly small. Okay, so that's conceptually what we're doing and we can see it in the diagrams, right? So we took this calculation, took the S, T, and U channel diagrams that look like this and simply replaced them by a set of effective vertices, okay? And now notice that it's not that we replace one diagram by one effective vertex, Okay, one of the important points I want you to take away from this is that we got effective contributions for with multiple different momentum structures, okay? So when we wrote the effective Lagrangian uh, here, right, we corrected the phi to the fourth term, but we introduced a new interaction, okay? A higher order interaction in the theory. And this is higher order in the power counting because remember from last time, we power count derivatives as lambda. Okay, now I'm using lambda two ways. But the derivative power counts like the power counting parameter, okay? So this is like that parameter squared. The fields count like that parameter. So this is a power counting to the sixth interaction. Okay. Higher power than this, which is just power counting to the fourth. Okay. And of course, you know, that diagram up there is similarly the same story is going to hold. This is going to shrink to a series of six point interactions, okay, all local. So again, the lines all shrink to points, okay. Um, good. So there's uh, one more point I want to make here, which is that when we have, um, where should I put it? put it here, when we have more complicated diagrams, okay, that have eta propagators and phi propagators, the same, the same thing's going to happen, okay, but it's going to look a little bit more complicated. So um, for example, um, let me do something like this, okay? So now, notice what I have is 
I have a phi propagator here. Let me draw it a little bit more obviously. Okay, so I've used the interaction eta phi squared here and here, and then here I've used the phi to the fourth interaction. Okay, this is in the UV theory. And now, notice what happens when I follow just these pictorial rules and I shrink my heavy lines to a point, okay, what I get is this, and then where one of the legs has a phi propagator and this phi to the fourth interaction, okay? So, the rules for everything I calculate in the full theory need to be reduced, reproduced by the effective theory. And notice that's exactly what's gonna happen. If I systematically follow this procedure, okay, now in the effective theory I have this new type of vertex, and I can just use that type of vertex here in this diagram, and I'm gonna get the right answer, okay? But especially when we get to loops, you can imagine situations where you have phi propagators in a loop, okay, and there's gonna be a puzzle that we're gonna encounter and solve, which is how to think about loops that involve both phi propagators and eta propagators, okay? And you won't be surprised, what's gonna end up happening is everything's gonna work out, we're gonna get a local expansion, and where all of the phi propagation is gonna be modeled in the effective theory, okay? Um, but this is, this is already hinting at the fact that we need all of the IR dynamics to, to still be there, okay? So, in particular, you could use this to identify what this vertex is in the effective theory if you wanted, but it's gonna make your life more complicated, okay? So when doing this procedure using Feynman diagrams, you should be a little bit careful. You should think about which diagrams you wanna use in order to compute the effective vertices, right? I would recommend doing this because you target the effective vertex as directly as possible, right? As opposed to using this where it's more complicated. And by the way, here I'm being a little bit sloppy, which you should really do in the effective theory is you should also draw a diagram like this, okay? And in fact, keeping track of the various factors of two, symmetry factors, all of this garbage that shows up um, is the hard part, right? Getting the twos right um, is critical to the success of everything, but, um, but you really need to be systematic and include both, type, both the vertex here on this side and here, or include the right symmetry factor, okay, depending on the way you think about it, okay? Um, so these toy models are, um, are actually, in some sense, they become a, quite a bit more complicated when you get to these higher point diagrams because the, the fact that all the legs are identical, now you have so many different ways you can permute the labels and so on, okay? So the bookkeeping becomes a bit of a mess. It's actually easier when you have charge flow because then you can distinguish the lines and so on. But um, for the simple examples we're gonna do together, uh, we're not gonna really conf confront that uh, issue too much, okay? Um, all right, so does this picture make sense? So, oh, please. On the right, yeah. Good, so, um, so what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the, um, so this is sort of to leading order in the expansion. So to leading order, I would get either the dimension, the, the correction here or the correction here. But if I wanted to go to higher order, really it would be better to just treat both of these as the effective vertex and do the expansion systematically, oh, right? Yeah, so that, that's maybe the way I drew it, it's a little bit confusing, but that's what I was trying to illustrate, right? Absolutely, you should really think of both of these as effective vertices, yeah. Um, and, but, but again, the, the other key point is just that the, the light particle propagation is reproduced in the EFT, right? So going from the full theory to the EFT, the eta propagators all shrink to points, the phi propagators come along for the ride, okay? Any other questions about this? Okay. So, um, 
This procedure, which we haven't done so systematically, but hopefully you're getting a feeling for it. Maybe you're familiar with this anyway. This is, um, this is what we call a matching calculation. Okay, so it literally means we want to match diagrams in the full theory and the effective theory. We tailor expand the diagrams in the full theory. We include as many operators as we need to in the effective theory to capture the terms in that tailor expansion of the full theory. And we just equate the terms in order to derive the coefficients in the effective theory as a function of the full theory parameters. Okay, so there's a little bit of philosophy here. There's two points of view on what an effective field theory is doing for us. Either you can think about it as giving you unknown coefficients, parameterizing your ignorance, and then you go out and you use experiment, you fix all those different coefficients, and from that point forward you can make predictions. Or you can think about what you're doing is secretly, there's a more fundamental description with far fewer parameters, and there are correlations among the EFT parameters. You may not know what they are, but if you make a UV assumption, if I write this model with eta in it, now I can calculate all the effective vertices in my, in my low energy theory as a function of the parameters in the full theory. Okay? And so you can think about when you do experiments in terms of an EFT description, what you're really doing is you're probing more fundamental physics. It's just obscured. And there are hidden correlations that you may not have access to unless you make a UV assumption. And the way to connect the parameters of the UV theory and the parameters of the EFT is this procedure we call matching. Okay. Yes? Yes. Um, so that's one of the tricky things. Getting that right is, is some of the hard work. So um, here, here I've been a bit sloppy. To, to do what you're asking um, systematically, the first step is you need to write out a basis of the operators in the EFT, okay? It needs to be complete. So, okay, step one, you specify, um, I wanna work to some order in the power counting expansion. So that tells you how many uh, types of operators you should include, how many derivatives, how many fields. Once you've done that, then it's your job to, um, to write down a basis of operators, which is complete, okay? And that's actually quite tricky because, like we talked about last time, we can do field redefinitions and we have integration by parts. So we can move derivatives around and so some operators will be redundant, right? Like what we did with the kinetic term yesterday. So just writing down a basis of operators is, uh, is a non-trivial task. Um, in fact, for, this, for the standard model EFT, for SMEFT, um, the, the, the now classic basis that everyone uses, which um, goes by the name of the Warsaw basis, um, wasn't actually constructed until, I forget when that paper came out. Do you remember? It was 15 years ago or something. 10, yeah, 2010, right? So that's, that's really quite recent, given that we've understood that the standard model should be an EFT for, for you know, since the late 70s, early 80s. And so, um, the, since it was written down, essentially, right? And so, um, actually getting the, just the basis, uh, the complete basis that's not over-complete is a big task. Once you have it, then you just turn a crank, okay? You calculate all the diagrams. Okay, I would do it this way. You calculate all the diagrams that look like this, given your set of operators, they may have more and more derivatives. You take this, you tailor expand, and then you just equate until you've fixed all the coefficients, okay? Um, but yeah, in, in practice, especially going beyond sort of the leading order, it's, it's quite, a, quite a job. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, good. It's just it's just you replace every factor of derivative by um, uh, minus i momentum, and then you um, there. So in this term, for example, um, there's uh, 
So I would write a Feynman rule that looks like this. And I would pick two of the legs, okay? And I would assign them momentum, you know, PA, PB. And then this box, since it hits both these fields, it gives me the sum of the momenta flowing in, okay? And so up to the signs and the eyes, it's gonna give me PA plus P, PB squared because there's two of them, okay? Yeah. If you change the direction, you change the sign, right? So if you have flow both in the same direction, you get a plus sign. If, if the flow is through the diagram, you get a, a relative minus sign, okay? Um, good, yes, please. Yeah. Great question, yeah. Um, in principle, no. So in principle, if you, you pick your basis, as long as it's complete or overcomplete, right? You have all the operators you need to do the matching, then as long as you do the matching in that basis, and then you always compute with that set of operators, you're good, you're gonna get the right answer. You're making life harder because your Feynman rules are more complicated, okay? The, there is a conceptual reason why we care about the dimension of the operator basis though, which is that it tells us how many independent observables we need to fix the coefficients, okay? So from the top down, there's really no issue for exactly the reason you say. But from the bottom up, there's an important conceptual issue, which is just to understand um, how, how to map from observables to constraints on the theory or to understand the properties of the theory. Okay, um, so let's see. This is maybe a good time to emphasize something else, um, which is the connection to renormalization. Um, so, I told you yesterday, one of my uh, slogans is um, EFT is renormalization, or I forget exactly how I said it. Okay, these are equivalent ideas. So already at this point, um, I can explain a little bit about why I say that, what I mean. And the, the, the key point is here, okay? So look at what we did. We started with this theory where we define some coupling lambda, we have all these other couplings. Then we integrate out the heavy state, and we find that at low energies, there's an effective coupling in front of phi to the four that is modified with respect to what it was in the UV, okay? And, but it's modified in this way, it just shifts the coupling, okay? In EFT, we also generate more operators, but the idea here is exactly the same as what we do in renormalization, okay? So let me, let me say a little bit more about what I mean by that. It's just that with renormalization, there's, two, there's basically two steps, right? We compute some loop, it diverges. So what do we do when we encounter a divergence? We, we introduce some kind of regulator parameter, and the, that regulator is associated with some physical effect, okay? The fact that there's a UV divergence is telling us that there's UV sensitivity at low energies, okay? Our theory somehow is, uh, knows that there's a deeper theory in the ultraviolet, and it reflects that through the fact that the loops diverge. But we don't know what the theory is in the ultraviolet. So all we can do at low energies is parametrize our ignorance in the UV by introducing some kind of regulator. But the key idea of renormalization is that all of that UV physics is all associated with contributions to coefficients of local operators, okay? So what do we do in practice? We introduce counter terms. We set the counter terms to cancel the divergences. We do this procedure that seems completely bonkers, okay? And then we introduce this idea of schemes, which is very complicated, and it obscures completely what's really going on which is just 
the principles of effective field theory. It's the fact that UV physics decouples, that when we have some unknown UV physics, the only way it can manifest is by contributing to the coefficients of local operators. The only difference between the paradigm of renormalization and the paradigm of EFT is when we talk about renormalization and we do this exact same thing, we shift our coefficients in the low energy theory to absorb some UV phenomena, right? This is, this is a UV phenomena right here. It goes like 1 over m eta. Then we call this thing in the low energy theory, we call this lambda effective, okay? And we just work with this. We don't care that it absorbed UV physics. This is the thing we can measure at low energies, right? When we're doing QED and we go out and we measure uh, the mass of the electron or we measure the fine structure constant, that's a low energy measurement we're making and it fixes this parameter. It has all kinds of UV garbage in it in principle, but we don't care because at low energies we have a local theory where all of the physics is, is contained in coefficients of local operators, all the UV physics, okay? The exact same thing happens here. And again, so the only difference when we do renormalization is at the end of a calculation, we take the cutoff to infinity, right? Sort of becomes a trivial step because we've tuned all these counter terms so that everything's independent of that choice. What does that do here? Well, that gets rid of higher dimension operators, okay? So that's it. Renormalization and EFT are the same thing, but when we do matching in perturbative EFTs, we actually know the UV model, okay, by assumption. We're saying, here is the UV model. Let's actually compute its influence at low energies, okay? So we can actually compute this lambda effective from a more complete theory, but the principles that underlie why this procedure works and why renormalization work are exactly the same, okay? It's all this idea of decoupling and locality, okay? Um, so to me, once, once, you, once you see renormalization through that lens, then it's not mysterious anymore. In fact, it's, um, it's inevitable, okay? And, um, and, and anyway, and that makes the connection here. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't, that's not here yet. Yeah, yeah, that's not here yet. We won't see that till we get to resummation. And, and yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, that's actually related to, um, Francesco's question too. So we'll, we'll see that when we get into loops. Um, so maybe just hold, let me, let me get, get into that like next lecture or something and then see if it starts to make sense. But, um, but there's, uh, all of that story has, all of its origins or the connections in EFT are, are, are also very strong. Yeah, it's, it's basically the same ideas. Um, yeah. Ah, very good, very good. That's, that's because we teach renormalization in, I think, in a, in a stupid way, okay? Seriously, because the, um, uh, what, we're really, what we're really doing is we're, we're saying that um, the UV exists, okay? The, at some level, when you define your quantum field theory, um, we, we introduce this idea of the bare couplings, okay? And what we're, really, what we're really doing there, although it's not how we usually say it, is we are assuming that the theory is handed to us from on high at some scale, okay? And at that scale, the bare couplings are defined, okay? Now, for historical reasons, we, we like to think of, that, of taking that scale to infinity. And I even said it here because that connects to what we typically do in renormalization. But, but the... Physically, we really do expect that there is some fundamental say, scale, say, associated with string theory, whatever it is, right, where the theory is UV complete, okay? But we don't know what it is. 
And the, the incredible thing about quantum field theory in general, which is effective field theory, is the same idea, is that we don't have to know, okay? So that's the point I'm trying to make here, is that if I just work with these effective couplings, right, even though they have UV dependence in them, I don't have to know what that UV dependence is, okay? I can just work with the low energy coupling, right? And when we get to loops, when we introduce loops, they bring in even more UV dependence, right? This is kind of a tree level UV dependence. When we do loops, there's gonna be loop corrections to this formula too, okay? But again, all the paradigm of renormalization is about is basically isolating order by order in the loop expansion. What do we mean by the effective coupling at low energies? We separate off the UV divergent part and we absorb it into the definition of the coupling because we know that UV contributions only change local, the coefficients of local operators. And that's, that's the statement of EFT, right? So that's why I say they're the same phenomenon. Now, we can take the cup, cut off to infinity or not, but once we've done this procedure, once we've, we've separated out the UV part, absorbed it into the couplings, then we don't care, right? And so, um, now, in, for example, in dimensional regularization, which we'll use in these lectures and, and which is the easiest tool to use, um, we do technically take the cutoff to infinity. It's this abstract thing, right? Because we have this epsilon and whatever. We need to go back to four dimensions, okay? Um, but again, really, the, the way I think about it now is, is just that there is some cutoff and all we're doing is we're modeling the unknown UV physics and we're, and again, we're just absorbing that unknown UV physics into a definition of the coupling, okay? If decoupling didn't work, if EFT didn't work, then UV physics would introduce non-locality or it would introduce new types of terms, right? Um, and, um, and so that's, again, that's really the, um, it's, a, it's a very big idea. It's so built into the, the framework that sometimes we don't appreciate it, but that's a part of why I keep emphasizing it because I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's absolutely remarkable that, that any of this works, right? Um, I should also say, um, you may be familiar with, um, there's a, a proof by Polchinski uh, on um, the renormalizability of, um, of quantum field theories. And, and I think he deserves credit he, for, for this idea. Um, I don't know that he says it exactly in this language, but what he does in this paper um, is, uh, is he effectively shows you what I described. So he uses Wilsonian effective field theory, which we're not gonna really talk about in detail, but this is this idea of integrating out a momentum shell and generating all of the tower of local operators that, um, that, that, that come up when you do that integrating out a shell. And then he shows that you can take the limit of the cutoff going to infinity, holding the low energy parameters fixed, such that all of the higher dimension operators vanish, right? And that's what we mean by renormalizability, is that we can work with the theory only including operators up to mass dimension four, right? Only including the renormalizable operators, and that we don't have to introduce any new ones to absorb the divergences, right? Um, and, and again, that comes back to how many coefficients do we need in order to, um, to absorb the unknown UV, uh, UV physics to parameterize that, that ignorance, okay? Good. It's a, it's a different way of thinking about it, so, um, so let, it, let it sink in and, and we should talk about it more as you think about it, okay? Um, good, I think this is a good point uh, to take a coffee break, so, um, why don't we, I realize five minutes doesn't really work, so why don't we uh, come back at five after, that's close to 10 minutes. Uh, we'll resume then, and um, I wanna show you a, Okay, um, this is fantastic. I'm, uh, I'm generating controversy, so um, uh, it's, it's, it's very good. 
Um, so um, the next uh, the next idea I want to convey is um, now that we we've have this idea of matching. Okay, we we see that the low energy parameters can absorb UV uh, UV phenomena into them. Um, I want to use this idea of integrating out a heavy particle, and I want to take it very literally, and um, and I want to show you at tree level that we can solve that formula for the path integral, okay? And that what it does for us is it generates the EFT automatically, okay? And that's to convince you, at least at tree level, that um, this procedure where I'm drawing diagrams and equating them and whatever um, is 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 deeper than that, okay? That we really are genuinely integrating out heavy physics, um, and um, so the first thing I need to do in order to be more systematic is uh, I want to specify the power counting. Okay, so I'm going to keep working with this example up here, although I'll start simplifying it by turning off some couplings just to keep the algebra manageable. Um, but for now, okay, we're going to assume, make a UV assumption that all of our dimensionful parameters, g and g prime, um, are of order m eta, and we'll define this to be our heavy scale capital M, okay? Because we're going to count powers of capital M versus little m, basically. Um, and we're going to assume that our dimensionless parameters, lambda, lambda prime, and lambda double prime, are all order one, okay? Um, until we turn them off. But, but for now, right, we have this generic renormalizable theory, and we're going to assume that there's no special parameters, nothing weird's going on. Okay. Um, and then we're going to derive an effective Lagrangian as a sum over n and m, 1 over m to the n plus m minus 4 dn phi m um, with only even powers of phi and d, right? Even powers of d by Lorentz invariance, even powers of phi by the assumption of the Z2 symmetry, okay? Um, again, this is, this is mostly just to simplify our lives here, but notice especially, right, we have these dimensionful couplings, and by assuming they're of order m, that's, that's a choice in the UV of the power counting, okay? So I, I just can't emphasize that enough. Um, okay, so we'll just compute order by order in a perturbative expansion. Um, and uh, the truncation um, is uh, some order in e squared over m squared, right? To some power, and so we choose, as we do this iterative procedure, right, we choose how high we want to go in this expansion based on, say, the accuracy of the experiment we're trying to compare to, okay? So again, we're in some fantasy world where we can do these phi scattering experiments. To, we take some amount of data that gives us some accuracy, um, and so we can basically check that our theoretical calculation is uh, accurate enough to compare with whatever the statistical power of our data is. Okay. okay, so let's talk about the technique here. Let's integrate out eta using the equations of motion. Okay, um, and the underlying principle here that lets us do this is called the semi-classical expansion. Okay, what's the semi-classical expansion? Well, it's basically the statement that I can write the effective action as the action for the field phi, which I'm treating as a fully quantum field, and the field eta evaluated on its equations of motion, okay, classical equations of motion, plus corrections of order h bar, okay? So 
the fluctuations of eta are going to give me loop corrections, but the classical solution here, where I'm going to leave phi unfixed, so it's going to have it's going to be some polynomial in phi, um, model all of the tree-level dynamics of the heavy field. Okay, um, and what do I mean by the equations of motion? Of course, I mean that I take the first variation of the action with respect to eta, evaluated on this classical solution gives me zero, okay? So I'm minimizing the action, as we always do, right, to find equations of motion. All right. So this is the, this is the idea, right? We're, um, oh, it's not on the board anymore, but we're, we're really computing this now as a loop expansion, okay? And, um, and we're going to use this uh, to concretely calculate the effective theory. Um, so I'm going to keep, still keep that up there for reference. Let's see. And I want to show you that I'm going to match that term up at the top that we got from diagrams. So I'll leave that too. So um, the EOM for eta looks like the following. We have box eta plus m eta squared eta plus g over 2 phi squared plus g prime over 2 eta squared plus lambda prime over 2 eta phi squared plus lambda double prime uh, over 6 eta cubed equals 0. Okay? So that's the polynomial I need to solve. Of course, uh, it's a cubic, it's a mess, right? So, um, so instead of just solving it and plugging in, which of course you could do if you would use Mathematica, you'd have to be careful about um, roots of the polynomial, but, but in principle you can do that. Uh, we're gonna solve it iteratively because we're interested in effective field theory anyway, so we're looking for something that's an expansion, okay? So let's solve this um, as an expansion. And so um, in order to do that, we notice Um, iteratively. So the first order contribution is just the one proportional to phi squared okay so I'm gonna I think this is intuitive but I'm gonna make this claim okay that all of these other terms in the solution are going to give me something higher order when I try to invert this. Okay, so the one over box and the higher powers of eta. I'm going to show you that this is self-consistent. Okay, so I take this as the leading term, and then I can use it to check that all the other terms here are higher order. So let's do that. Um, So we get eta classical is minus g over 2 m eta squared phi squared plus 1 over m eta squared box eta classical. Okay, so here I just divided by m eta squared and moved, um, moved things around the equal sign. And now if this is order 1 over m, then I see, right, the leading behavior of eta classical um, is 1 over m, but then I have two factors of 1 over m here, so I get 1 over m cubed. This one I get, similarly, I have eta classical, which goes like 1 over m to leading order, uh, and so then two extra suppression factors here, so I get 1 over m cubed. Same here. 
uh, right? Remember, G prime goes like M, so this is a one over M suppression, but I have two factors of eta classical. And here um, I have one over M to the fifth. To the fifth? Uh, this should be cubed. Okay? So again, this tells me how to iterate, okay? So I want to go to the next order. What I do, I plug eta classical one in here, here, and here. I neglect this term, right? And that gives me the next terms and the expansion. Um, I think now I can finally erase that. So, Now, uh, eta classical cubed looks like minus g 2 m eta squared phi squared plus g over 2 m eta to the fourth box phi squared plus g lambda prime over 4 Oof. Okay, so then what do I do with this? I plug it back into the Lagrangian, right? That was my semi-classical expansion. I find the classical solution to the equations of motion. I plug it back in to the Lagrangian where I'm leaving phi as a free field that I'm going to integrate over in the path integral. Um, and so when you do that, you get L effective is one half d phi squared minus one half m phi squared phi squared, and then minus one over four factorial lambda minus three g squared over eta squared phi to the fourth over six factorial. No warranty implied on these coefficients, by the way. I um, think I got the right ones, but I've had mistakes in them in the past. So don't be surprised if you go check this, uh, if you find some different factors. You could always email me. Okay. So um, what do we find? Well, we find, for example, just by doing this algebraic procedure, Right? We get exactly the same coefficient of phi to the fourth in the effective theory. We also generate this operator, right? even with the correct sign, because I integrate this by parts, right? and I get box. And that flips the sign. Okay? And here I've derived the phi to the sixth interaction for you, too. Okay. Um, I guess I forgot. I, yeah, I didn't turn off any couplings. We just, we just discarded the 1 over m to the fifth. Okay, so this agrees with. Um, the possible terms we, or the terms we got just by studying this, the structure of the diagrams, okay? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Same result, but ah, yeah, yeah, very good. You see, because yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because I. That's that's because I'm uh, I'm playing games here. So in the sense that um, the uh, so so I got this by just Taylor expanding the diagrams, right? And it is a slightly different basis. Notice I have to integrate by parts. But if you remember, what did I get in the diagrams? I got s plus t plus u, right? In that in that term. Now I chose to model that as box. But the next thing I'm going to do is use that s plus t plus u is 4m squared okay. to eliminate the derivatives. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're, you're exactly right. Um, and, um, but I left it that way because I, because I, I knew I was going to show you this. Yeah, exactly. Good. Um, so before I get to this point, though, I want to make uh, um, 
I want to make an important other point here, which is that um, notice what happened, okay? The difference between what we did with the diagrammatic matching and what we did here with what I would, uh, what I'll call functional matching. Okay, so um, why functional? Because we're using the functional integral, right? We're actually evaluating the path integral. And um, the, the benefit of diagrammatic matching is that it uses Feynman diagrams, everyone's favorite tool, and, um, and it's very pictorial, okay? This is more abstract, but notice when I, and we talked about this a bit, that when I do the diagrammatic matching, I have to know the EFT in advance because I have to do the calculation in the EFT in order to match order each of these sets of diagrams, okay? That requires me to specify a basis, to make sure it's a complete basis, it's, and so on, okay? Whereas functional matching, once I, um, I have the insight that I can solve the path integral directly and just use the semi-classical expansion to derive the EFT, I don't have to know the EFT in advance. I get it for free, right? This generated some set of operators. Now, as uh, Diego was noticing, right, it's actually generating maybe not the simplest basis, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Nonetheless, it's the right answer, and now I can play with it and manipulate it and put it into a simpler form, but I don't have to know the operators in advance, okay? And this is easy to do at tree level, okay? You probably have even seen this before. Um, at loop level, it's not so easy, but um, this is a, an area of active research. It's something I've worked on a bit uh, myself. Um, you can use essentially a one-loop generalization of these same ideas and actually compute matching coefficients at one loop um, using these, the, essentially the same idea and something called the covariant derivative expansion. And um, the, again, the benefit there is that if you do this at loop level, you don't have to know the operators in advance. You just turn a crank and out pop the operators with the correct coefficients at loop level. Okay, um, and we'll talk about, um, we, won't, we won't get into this, I mean, we can talk about it in the discussion if you want, but we won't get into this in detail, but um, uh, I just want you to be aware of it because now um, there's a automated package that does this uh, called Machete. My collaborators and I wrote a piece of code a few years ago now that, that does the hard part, but the, the, then these guys who wrote Machete did this awesome, uh, awesome job of making this this very easy to use. So now these kind of tools are already um, available as a as a package. And if you're doing this kind of stuff in your research, um, go read about this. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, conceptual theoretical tool. But also then you can just go use these packages and um, save yourself a lot of trouble. Okay. Um, and it, I mean, just to say this this point about generating the operators for free is no small thing. Um, one of the things my collaborators and I did in one of our papers on this, we just computed the one loop matching for the singlet extension of the standard model. This is a, this is a, a, a calculation that had been done by multiple other collaborations. Um, it's at least in three other papers. Um, and the most recent had corrected, uh, of course it's really hard, so um, the, there were, there were missing diagrams, essentially missing terms in in paper after paper, and um, and so the paper before ours used diagrammatic matching, and I said, oh, we finally have the complete thing, and they missed a term because there's some stupid flavor coupling that you know they had to remember to put in. They forgot. It's not in their paper, but for us, it just popped out, and then we were studying these tables and said, oh, look, we found this tiny little thing that, um, that they missed. We didn't have to be smart. We just had to be methodical, right, turn a crank. So I, I really think, um, uh, this, this is not a small thing that you get the operators for free, okay? So that's all I wanna say. All right, good. Um, so now, what do we do? We got this result, but it's in some random basis. And so we've talked about this already um, a bit, but I just wanna, uh, um, last time, but I think it's worth repeating and, um, and writing a few equations. Now that we have this example, um, I can uh, show you these standard tools for simplifying an effective theory because um, this, this is typically the last step you would do uh, to compare with, say, experimental results or so on, right? And, and again, it's important 
that you're in the same basis uh, as whatever observable you're comparing to, um, because if not, you can get effects from other operators that you may miss and so on. So, um, so it's, it's good to take one step further from this, okay? Um, so the two strategies for simplifying are um, integration by parts and field redefinitions, okay? So we can use um, integration by parts, for example, to classify uh, all possible terms of the form d squared phi to the n, okay? Um, and um, sorry, even better than that, d to the, I think, uh, whatever, d to some power phi to the n, okay? Um, so we can use the fact that d mu phi to the r is r phi to the r minus one d mu phi um, to rewrite operators so that the derivative only acts on a single field, okay? So we can always do that. By the way, this is, this is just a simple example, right? This is a, a theory with one type of real scalar field and derivatives acting on it. Um, and then um, that implies that the, um, ah, it is d, I'm sorry, I'm getting tired. It is d squared. That implies that the uh, most general operator looks like this, phi to the n minus one, box phi, and phi to the n minus two, d mu phi, d mu phi. Okay, so again, by assumption, I'm just looking for two derivatives and any number of phi's, okay? So I use this and I can get down to, to operators of these two forms. But now I can take this one and I can use integration by parts, okay, um, to simplify it. So I have uh, phi to the n minus two d mu phi d mu phi is one over n minus one d mu phi to the n minus one d mu phi. And that's um, equal to minus one over n minus one phi to the n minus one box phi plus a total derivative, which we throw away. Okay, so this tells us that there's only one independent operator, okay, for any, uh, any structure like this, okay, with two derivatives in any number of fields. Um, then the other trick I can use are field redefinitions, and so I wanna quickly, um, show you why that's typically called um, using the equations of motion. So let me. Do that here. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, um, also known as use the EOMs. And, um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace phi goes to phi plus some function of phi, okay? This is um, essentially accounts for all the allowed field redefinitions. This function has to be analytic, so it's a local operator expansion, no surprise there. Um, but you actually need there to be a linear term also, um, phi goes to phi plus stuff. Uh, this is so you don't mess up the, um, the fact that phi is an interpolating field, you know, that it generates single particle states for you. Um, and so, um, so we'll do this and expand order by order in this F thing. Um, so the Lagrangian of the form one half d phi squared minus V becomes one half d phi squared minus V minus f of phi times box phi plus v prime plus order f squared, okay? And this thing is the equation, the original equations of motion, okay? Um, and so we can use this 
trick to simplify this example. Um, and so that looks like the following. So if we use phi goes to phi plus c g squared over m eta to the fourth phi cubed, okay, then we can solve for this c. Notice here, right, I expanded in powers of f of phi. Why am I allowed to do that? Well, because I knew that the type of field redefinition I'm going to do is um, one that changes orders in power counting. Okay, so I'm mixing leading order in power counting with something that's higher order. Okay, so I'm doing EFT, so I should expand and you know always expand to to the order I need. And so um, so that sort of justifies this step. And again, I want to emphasize: people say it's using the equations of motion to simplify the expressions, but that's only true to leading order in this expansion, okay? If you want to do something to higher order in the EFT, you've got to be careful. Um, and uh, this is not, this is an important fact. Uh, um, showed up in a recent project of mine. We were making a mistake because we were just using the equations of motion and then realized, oh, but we're going to next order in the power counting, so we need to be more careful um, and actually do the field redefinition. Anyway, so we can plug this in. Um, L effective goes to L effective plus C G squared over M eta to the fourth phi cubed box phi plus M phi squared phi plus lambda over three factorial phi cubed plus higher orders in the one over M expansion. Okay. Um, and then the game here is just to pick this C, okay. Uh, so that it cancels um, the derivative term that appears there, okay? Uh, and so that's typically the game. That's what the Warsaw basis is about for the standard model EFT. They basically found the basis with the fewest number of derivatives, okay? So they kept using the equations of motion um, to simplify the Lagrangian down to the form with the fewest derivatives. That's because, like we were talking about before, Feynman rules with derivatives in them are more annoying, so you might as well pick the basis with the, with the fewest uh, number of those annoying terms, okay? And what happens is if you pick, um, put it here, So if you pick c equals a half, then you cancel uh, the derivative term, and L effective goes to one half d phi squared minus the mass term. Lacordic Okay, so now we have um, this correction, which is order one in our power counting, and here we have a subleading correction, right? Because it goes like g squared over m eta to the fourth. This is m squared over m to the fourth because it's proportional to, to the phi mass squared. And that's because we did this field redefinition, right, when we plugged this in um, here, right, to get a phi to the fourth term, um, it was the term proportional to the mass that, that generated this, right? Um, and then we get one over six factorial g squared 45 lambda prime minus 60 lambda for m eta to the fourth minus Again, these coefficients aren't really the point, other than to say that there are, there's some numbers there, right? And they're totally concrete. Um, okay, and um, and we see indeed that to this order, the derivative terms are eliminated. Um, and as I said before, 
really what we did is if you go back to earlier today, um, we, we used the fact that s plus t plus u equals 4 m squared, m phi squared, and that's where this came from, right? So we swapped a derivative term um, here, right? This derivative term, which had four phi's and two derivatives, that was really giving us in the, in the expansion s plus t plus u, which is 4 m phi squared, and indeed that's what came out from uh, doing this fill redefinition. Ah, uh, yeah, but um, the if I when I did the matching, right? The matching was for the the on shell four point, and so yeah, so I could use this relation uh, would have held for for that co Wilson coefficient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. Okay. Um, Any other questions about that? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, please. That's right. So um, the some of that we'll come back to when we do loops. Um, but the um, but yeah, it's critical in this procedure that any time you encounter an infrared divergence, um, that you regulate it the same way on both sides. So that's kind of when I was talking about these diagrams, um, like this one, for example, with effective vertices here, but a low energy propagator. Um, the so it's the same spirit is is matching this kind of process. The infrared contributions here from the propagation, but if it were in a loop, which we'll talk about this uh, starting next time, if it's in a loop, then the, um, the infrared divergence in this loop needs to cancel um, an infrared divergence that appears in the full theory loop in the matching. Oh, I haven't really showed you. Yeah, 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 so good. So. Um, uh, hopefully that'll be clear when we do some loops, you'll see. Um, but the, um, basically what you need to happen is anytime there's a loop with a, with a light particle or a massless particle in it, you need to find the same stru loop structure on the, both sides of the calculation and they're gonna cancel in the matching. Ah, very good, very good. Okay, um, yeah, because there's a, there's a um, when you do this beyond tree level, um, when you do this, this functional matching beyond tree level, um, you need to uh, use the method of regions to, to extract the hard region, and that's how you avoid the infrared divergences. So there's an extra, there's an extra ingredient. We use, we use more technology that, that um, basically avoids all those issues. Um, in a, in a really clever way, not that we invented, but um, we'll talk about that a little bit, but yeah, um, but that's the, um, the idea there. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so um, in the last 15 minutes, um, we've, we've done a lot today, so I, I, um, I think I'll only emphasize one more thing, and then we'll, we'll have our discussion session so we have more time to, um, to talk through stuff, um, which is we can use this example um, to really understand this idea of uh, the universality of the EFT. Um, so, And the point here is that different UV theories can yield the same EFT. And here what I mean is 
anytime you have an EFT and you truncate it to some finite order in the power counting, there's an infinite number of possible UV completions that could give you the same low energy predictions. If you include all orders in the EFT expansion, then that's effectively including all the effects of the full theory, okay? And so you reproduce the physics of the full theory. So if you, um, so basically, I mean, it's, it's sort of a one-to-one -one thing. If you, um, if you discover the UV physics, right, then you could compute the EFT Lagrangian to arbitrarily high order, right? But if you don't know the UV physics, then you're always at some level um, approximating it. You're always gonna truncate, and, um, and so, so you can't tell, tell the difference indirectly, right? The, so this is telling us the limitations of indirect probes, right? If we're only studying the phi particles, we never make the eta particle in our collider, then we can never be absolutely sure that it's the UV completion we've been talking about today with the single eta. Um, so um, let's just see how this works by generalizing our simple example here, okay? Um, so for, for, to make this point, we can add N um, heavy fields We'll give them a subscript i, a to sub i, and then we'll give the same Z2 symmetry. So we have phi goes to minus phi, eta goes to eta, okay? And then um, the Lagrangian is the same kinetic terms with one for each of these etas, um, and then the potential we could write This is just the most general potential up to dimension four, right? And it has many more couplings. Okay, so just the, well, I erased it, but just the generalization of that um, Lagrangian from earlier. And now if we do the same power counting, all the mass dimension full parameters are of order capital M, all the eta masses are of order capital M. We do exactly the same calculation, it's just keeping track of indices. Um, and the claim is that we get L effective, it's one half, D phi squared minus one half M phi squared phi squared, and then uh, minus lambda four effective, or four factorial phi to the fourth, lambda six effective, where, um, Lambda four effective is lambda minus some three g i squared um, eta i squared. Okay, so here we use the um, integration by parts and the field redefinition to get rid of the derivative terms like before, and then we get essentially just the generalization of what we had before. Okay, so I'm only writing lambda four here, but the point is simply that you get these additive contributions, okay? So I could easily, if all I measure is the two to two scattering of phi, there's a huge degeneracy, right? I make one of the etas a little lighter, make one a little heavier, right? There's an infinite number of ways. If I only fix this one coefficient that I could um, reproduce that physics, right? And so, Again, it's the idea because heavy physics decouples because it's always gonna come in um, with this uh, suppression, right? One over the heavy mass, then um, I can always play around with what's going on in the UV um, to reproduce the same physics in the IR, okay? Um,
Okay. Um, yeah. I really think I will, s I, I don't want to get into that today. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think I'm just going to leave it here because um, the next topic I, I don't want to rush and I'm sure, I'm sure you're you're all pretty fried. We've done a lot today. So um, happy to take questions. Otherwise, um, let's call it a day since we're going to get back together um, at 4.30, I guess in here, right? Okay. Yeah, in here we'll get back together at 4.30 and we can review any of this or talk about other stuff. And um, uh, yeah, so um, otherwise I'll, yeah, I'll see you in half an hour or so. Thanks.